Good morning. Welcome to our group's TED Talk. We're going to be discussing the case, the Cola Wars, for you today. And we hope to answer four intriguing questions. The first being, why historically has industry been so very successful? Secondly, we're going to compare and contrast the economics between the bottlers and the concentrate manufacturers. And thirdly, we're going to analyze the competition between Coke and Pepsi and how it has actually affected the industry profits. And then finally, we're going to talk about whether or not Coke and Pepsi can sustain their profits in the wake of ever-flattening demand and the introductions of new and alternative beverages into the marketplace. So sit back and enjoy a little bit of our flavor. That's good. Coca-Cola was formulated in 1886 by John Pemberton, a pharmacist in Atlanta, Georgia, who sold it to drugstore soda phones as a potion for mental and physical disorders. A few years later, as a candler acquired the formula, established a sales force, and began brand advertising of Coca-Cola. Tightly guarded in an Atlanta bank vault, the formula for Coca-Cola syrup remained a well-protected secret. Candler granted Coca-Cola's first bottling franchise in 1899 for only $1, believing the future of the drink rested with the soda fountains. However, the company's bottling network grew quickly, reaching 370 franchises by 1910. In its early years, Coke was constantly plagued by imitations and counterfeits, which they aggressively fought in court. 153 imitations of Coca-Cola were barred by the courts in 1916 alone. Coke introduced and patented a unique 6.5 skirt bottle to be used by its franchises that subsequently became an American icon. Robert Woodruff became the CEO of Coca-Cola in 1923 and began working with franchise bottlers to make Coke available wherever and whenever a consumer might want it. He argued that if Coke were not conveniently available when the consumer was thirsty, the sale would be lost forever. During the 1920s and the 1930s, Coke pioneered open top coolers to storekeepers, developed automatic fountain dispensers, and introduced vending machines. Woodruff also initiated lifestyle advertising for Coca-Cola, emphasizing the role of Coke in the consumer's life. In addition, Woodruff developed Coke's international business. During the beginning of World War II, at the request of General Eisenhower, he promised that every man in uniform gets a bottle of Coca-Cola for five cents wherever he is and whatever it costs the company. Coca-Cola bottling plants followed the movements of American troops. 64 plants in total were set up during the war. This contributed to Coke's dominant market share in most European and Asian countries. Pepsi-Cola was invented in 1893 by a North Carolina pharmacist, Caleb Bradham. Like Coke, Pepsi adopted a franchise bottling system and by 1910, it had built a network of 270 franchise bottlers. Pepsi struggled, however, declaring bankruptcy in 1923 and again in 1932. Business began to pick up again in the midst of the Great Depression when Pepsi lowered the price of its 12-ounce bottle to a nickel, the same price Coke charged for its 6.5-ounce bottle. In the late 1930s, Pepsi tried to expand its bottling network through small local bottlers striving to compete with wealthy Coke franchises. Pepsi nevertheless began to gain market share. In 1938, Coke filed a lawsuit against Pepsi, claiming Pepsi-Cola was an infringement on the Coca-Cola trademark. The court ruled in favor of Pepsi in 1941, ending a series of suits and countersuits between the two companies. With its famous radio jingle, twice as much for nickel too, Pepsi's U.S. sales surpassed those of Royal Crown and Dr. Pepper in the 1940s, trailing only to Coca-Cola. In 1950, Coke's share of the U.S. soft drink market was 47%, and Pepsi's was 
Hundreds of regional soft drink companies continue to produce a wide assortment of flavors. Question one. Why historically has a soft drink industry been so profitable? To better understand, let's take a look at the Porter's Five Forces model. The threat of substitute has been very low and is a major reason for why the industry is so profitable. While there were many substitutes available, the amount, of spent, the amount spent on advertising, branding, and making the product available greatly reduced the threat of substitutes. Brand loyalty has also been extremely high in the soft drink category. You're either a Pepsi guy or you're a Coke guy. I cannot lie to you on this one, man. Both Coca-Cola and Pepsi are heavy swingers in my book. The threat of new competitors has been low in the industry. This can be attributed to the franchisee agreements with the bottlers, which prohibits bottlers from working with competing products. Anyone trying to enter this industry is going to have an extremely difficult time finding distribution. The marketing and advertising spending in the industry are also very high because of the Pepsi Coke rivalry. If a new entrant wants to enter the industry, they have to have a lot of money to do so to compete with advertising. Retailer shelf space would also be very hard for new entrants to obtain. The bargaining pot power of suppliers is also very weak. The ingredients to make a carbonated soft drinks are basic commodities, and therefore the supplier has relatively no power in the pricing. Bargaining power of the customer is fairly moderate and is different across major channels. For example, in the vending channel, the buyer has no power, but in the fountain category, the buyer has much more power, and this is where most, a lot more negotiations take place. And this illustrates why Coke and Pepsi have such low margins in these channels. Rivalry in the industry is obviously extremely intense. Pepsi and Coke are competing head to head and this is actually forcing the industry to become more profitable, as we'll explain later. There are other things that are also driving the profitability. Demand for cola was increasing as U.S. consumption rose and bottling innovations. Distribution networks have also increased the availability. These are the reasons why the industry has been so successful. So basically, to summarize, the threat of substitutes is low, the threat of new competition is low, the bargaining suppliers, the bargaining power of suppliers is weak, and the bargaining power of the customers is moderate. For these reasons, it's a very profitable industry. Oh, no. It's tasty. <clears throat> Question number two is comparing the economics of the concentrate business to the bottling business and discuss around why the profitability is so different. So, first, we'll take a look at the concentrate business just in general. Uh, there's a lot less capital involved with setting up a plant to produce and distribute concentrate. Uh, really, you just need one plant in a country uh, and you can just produce all your concentrate into the packages, ship them off to your bottlers throughout the country. Roughly the cost is $25 $50 million uh, to set up a plant. Uh, the costs involved with concentrate besides producing are advertising promotions. They conduct research and a lot of bottler support. So for example, they negotiate the customer distribution agreements for the bottlers uh, on their behalf. The bottling industry, on the other hand, needs to be a lot more segmented. You can't just have one bottling uh, organization located somewhere. They're dispersed throughout the country, and they receive the packaging from the concentrate business, and then they add the carbonated water, they package it into a bottle or a can, and then distribute it to their, to their clients. <clears throat> um, it's a lot more capital intensive, four to $10 million per bottling plant to operate in a single line. Um, and there has been a lot, there has been a significant decrease in the amount of uh, bottling plants throughout the United States. In 1970, there was 2,000 bottling plants roughly uh, spread across the country, and today, in 2004, there's 300 bottling plants. So the question is, what is the relationship between these 
concentrate producers and uh, the bottlers. Really, they're very dependent upon each other. Uh, so just a quick look at their their costs. Um, for the concentrate business, COGS is 17% of their profits, while the bottler is 16% of their, of their sales, which leaves a gross profit margin of 83% for the concentrate business and 40% for the bottler. So you can see immediately that the concentrate business is much more profitable, but where they end up forking over a lot more of a cost is with their advertising. Their advertising is 43% of the gross margin, and the bottler is only 2%. So you can really see they pick up the slack in that area in order to keep the bottlers up and running. So that leaves a pre-tax profit of the concentrate business of 30% and the bottle business of 9%. So lastly, we're going to talk about the added value brought both by the concentrate producers and the bottlers. So for the concentrate producers, their biggest source of added value is their product, is their intellectual property behind what they're making. Uh, we, we know with Coke, uh, it's all intellectual property. They don't have uh, they don't have patents on their products. So there's only a select few individuals that know what their product actually entails. And they pulled out of a billion dollar market, or a billion person market in India, uh, specifically to protect that intellectual property. With bottlers, their biggest source of added value is their relationships with the concentrate producers and their relationships with their customers. So they put in contracts in place both with the concentrate producers and with their customers. And with the concentrate producers, what that does is essentially develop a little oligarchy and spread out throughout the United States with individual contracts with these with these concentrate producers. And then with their suppliers, they are or with their customers, they're continually renegotiating the contracts and they're developing long-term relationships, which really does provide a lot of value for the buyers. The competition between Pepsi and Coke. The competition between Pepsi and Coke have overall increased the industry profits. In actuality, one company justifies the existence of the other, and it justifies their marketing expenditure. Uh, the feeling is summarized by former Pepsi CEO Roger Enrico. And he says, if the Coca-Cola company didn't exist, we would pray for someone to invent them. And on the other side of the fence, I'm sure the folks at Coke would say that nothing contributes as much to the present day success of Coca-Cola than Pepsi. This shows the feeling that one company really needs the other one and that together they're working to grow the overall pie, the overall market share of the CSD industry. The competition between Coke and Pepsi has also spurred innovation and new methods as highlighted earlier. We talked about the lifestyle marketing where Pepsi had their Pepsi Generation marketing campaign, and Woodruff, the former CEO of Coke, also had their Coca-Cola lifestyle marketing campaigns. Also, the innovations led to bottler consolidation by both industries, Coke really beginning in the 1980s. And by 2004, Coca-Cola had consolidated its bottling operations and produced 95% of its own, while Pepsi had consolidated 87% of its bottling operations. The innovations continue with product expansions. Both companies moved into the non-carbonated soft drink line. Uh, these included juices, sports drinks like Gatorade and uh, Powerade, energy drinks, tea, and water. And eventually, from product expansion, both companies also moved into international expansion. They moved into global markets, and by 2004, the world market share held by Cadbury, the smallest one, was 6%. Pepsi had a world market share of 22%, and Coke in 2004 had a world market share of 51%. So overall, the competition between the two companies had led to a lot of developments, including product ex extensions and market extensions into the international market. Hello. I'm gonna answer the fourth question on whether or not Coke and Pepsi can actually sustain their profits with flattening demand and introduction of alternative drinks. You know, we still drink 10 billion cases of soda a year and more than any other beverage. Uh, they are also shifting their ideas by purchasing other alternative drink companies. You know, Pepsi has just bought Quaker Oats and also bought Sobe, and Coke has bought Dannon and, and the uh, Evian Water Group, and it's Smart Water, in fact. You know, Pepsi illustrates this really well by growing the core and adding some more. 
uh, you can see that Pepsi actually went away from the original Pepsi product and now highlights Diet Pepsi as their number one core product. And just the market demand alone for diet soft drinks has increased from 1997 to 2004 from 24.6% to 29% and kind of makes up for the regular soda production loss. So, although the years may change, the flavor of the soda remains the same and alternatives, however, are becoming more prominent. I mean, let's talk about Gatorade, Powerade, Lipton, Nest Tea, Tropicana, Minute Maid, but Sobe, Smart Water, Dasani, Aquafina, and Evian. All these are positioned to offer more uh, options to customers. Coke gains about 70% of their sales volume now from outside the U.S. and 80% of their overall profits. Uh, they had said that um, they have over 9 million outlets in nearly 200 countries, which is incredible if you can think about that distribution network. They also utilize one another to kind of see what's successful, see what the other is doing, and to match it and compete with them. And it is actually driving the growth of the entire pie. We hope you enjoyed our TED Talk on the Cola Wars as much as we had making it. Hopefully we uncovered the reasons why the industry has been so successful given intensive rivalry and decreasing demand for the traditional sodas. Moreover, these companies have a long history and tradition in American culture, and they participate to further the flavors of our everyday life now and into the future. Thank you so very much. Coca-Cola was formulated in 1886 by John Pemberton, a pharmacist in Atlanta, Georgia, who sold it at drugstore fountains as a potion for mental and physical disorders. Cola in 1923 and began working with franchise bottlers to make Coke available wherever and wherever and whenever the consumer might want it. He argued that if Coke were not convenient enough, cut, cut. <laughs> Actually, I do. I like it with people. I like being like cold beer. There's 300 bottling plants. So while they have been conglomerating, while they have been, uh, while they've been downsizing the number of plants, they're still pretty well spread throughout the country. The marketing and advertising spending in this industry are also extremely high. A little louder, Mike. Because of the, sorry. The marketing and advertising.